Yeah, it's really great to be here at the jQuery conference. Sorry to get you guys up and moving so quickly. It's sometimes a little difficult to get moving in the morning. This is what my cats do to me when they want me to get up. They usually do it whenever the light co starts coming through the window. So. And so today I'm going to tell you a, a bunch of really interesting things about jQuery, about what's been going on. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a cool story bro kind of thing. Um, the, the jQuery Foundation was created in March of 2012, uh, a little over a year ago. And it really is our way of coordinating the work that jQuery does for you. It not only includes code, but documentation. You, you and I hope a lot of people uh, realize the amount of work it is to write good documentation. And jQuery is really known for its, for its good documentation. And with all those websites, it requires infrastructure to, to maintain those, those websites. And then, of course, there are events like this, which we hold on a regular basis, so that you can learn more about jQuery. You can learn more about web development in general, because we just don't want to focus on you know, the mechanics and internals of jQuery, but we want, to, we want to help you become better web developers. So the, the jQuery Foundation is a nonprofit organization that is funded by um, some revenue from conferences, donations, memberships, and you or your company can become members. Some of you probably became members so that you could get discounted ticket prices, for example. Uh, there are various member benefits, cool things like t-shirts and bags and hoodies that we, we want to, you know, we want people to kind of spread the word about jQuery and when people see you in your jQuery t-shirt, say, hey, that's cool, where'd you get that? Uh, I had not seen the swag that we were gonna have here and I'm just blown away by that swag table. Uh, as Adam mentioned, those two little tokens that you got in your bag, they allow you to go to that swag table and exchange it for valuable and exciting prizes. So be sure to go over there and see some of that stuff. I love that orange jQuery UI shirt. Um, I'm gonna switch over here for a second and just show you the, if I can get over there. Where did it go? There we go. Um, the jQuery founding, uh, Foundation founding members found, 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 found. Um, WordPress, all of our documentation is built on WordPress. We have a pretty nice system for uh, generating the websites from GitHub, a very automated system that allows us to track every change we make. It allows people from the community to come and, commu and contribute to the documentation in a way that uses things like GitHub's pull request mechanism so that we can let the community help us. Media Temple provides a lot of that infrastructure that I talked about, the web servers, the CDN, where you can download or use jQuery directly from it. And then the gold members, uh, including uh, probably a local favorite, Intel, uh, and all of these other companies that, again, uh, provide both financial and uh, other support that allows jQuery to help you get your work done. And just to kind of go over some of the projects that we, we have, we've got, um, really, if you go to github.com slash jQuery, you can see just about everything that jQuery is working on. That includes what a lot of people just think of as jQuery, which is the code, core, UI, and mobile. The sizzle selector engine, which is inside jQuery core. The QUnit test framework. The jQuery migrate plugin, and I'll be saying a little bit more about the migrate plugin in a while. Uh, test Swarm, continuous integration testing, and the documentation sites. So I wanted to say a little bit, because Core is the closest to my heart, um, about the jQuery core plan and jQuery 1.x versus 2.x and how, how that works. jQuery 1x still supports IE 6, 7, and 8. We, we, we all wish that we didn't have to support IE 6, 7, 8. Uh, but there's... And I'll be saying a little bit more about that as well um, further into the talk. We all wish we didn't have to support it, but there's enough of it out there that we have to support it. 
Uh, if you're really lucky and you're working with a leading edge site and you can tell people, hey, you know, you've got to have at least IE9, IE10 to run this, then, then you're great. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of people out there, um, you know, if, even if you're running a retail site, do you want to turn away all the people still using IE8? I mean, they're probably, you know, there's a sucker born every minute, right? So those people are probably going to be able to buy whatever you want to offer. Um, so we decided, though, that having to support those browsers was holding us back. There's a lot of differences up to IE8 that cause, a, it cause the core to have more code, more complex code, and um, increase the size of the library. So we broke off jQuery 2x and we shipped it. We, however, wanted to guarantee you, developers, that you weren't really dealing with two completely different libraries. So those two versions are staying in sync API-wise. The, the APIs that, that are offered in both versions are the same, and we try to keep the behavior, the documented behavior, to be exactly the same on both of them. And both are being maintained, so you'll continue to see new releases come out on both of them for the time being. We announced this uh, back at the jQuery conference a year ago. We heavily publicized the changes, and we had several public betas, and we tried to communicate on the blogs, posts. We just, we let you guys know what we were doing, uh, what we were doing. So everything worked out great, right? We were like, yeah, cool, all right. We shipped two versions, one nine, two oh. And then we learned something. There's a lot of people out there who have production websites and they link to jQuery latest.js. What that means is every time we do a release, boom, they're on the latest version. I, thought, I think they probably saw that as a feature. But you have to remember that every time we make a new release, you know, there's going to be some things that changed. And in particular, with jQuery 1.9, we said, hey, there's some things that we're going to take out. And you need to be prepared for that. So, you know, get, get ready. You don't have to move immediately. Unless, of course, you're using jQuery latest. Um, but you should be prepared and take a look at what your code will require to make those changes. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who link to jQuery latest. There's also a lot of people who use the Google, uh, Google cache, CDN, and use the slash one the notation there. That is essentially an uncached version from the CDN. Uh, J, uh, the folks at Google are actually deprecating that behavior because it's so bad. It's like, why bother loading from the CDN if you're not going to cache it? And people loved it. Man, we just got such, <laughs> we, I've got to say, I have never seen users so animated about a release before. They just, they ate it all up. So we actually had a plan. The reason why this happened is because the person who did this, who, who this is one of these people who included jQuery latest. So um, what, what happened was I, I was actually taking a trip, so I had to push this, uh, push the release uh, live before I did the blog post, and I did it like at about four in the morning in San Francisco before I got on a plane to go to Baltimore. And so I, I push it live and I do the blog post, and then, you know, when I land in Baltimore, we didn't have Wi-Fi on the plane, when I land in Baltimore, there's just this maelstrom of, of activity, like, what happened? Something's happened to jQuery, you know, Twitter's blowing up, and I'm like, so it, it turned out a lot of, that's when we learned everybody used, or a lot of people used jQuery latest, and this is the effect. You know, people are like, you just upgraded me to something that broke my code. Well, no, you used a version you shouldn't be using. You know, you always want to know that your site works with the version you're using. So we actually have, and all, all you know, from the very beginning, we had a plan for making it so that you could take code that wasn't ready at the moment, but make it work. And on top of that, this tool would allow you to find out what was wrong and help you fix it. And that was the jQuery, the jQuery Migrate plugin. So with jQuery Migrate, 
you just include it on the page after jQuery, and it has two functions. Um, it will uh, log some things in the console telling you, hey, you're using an older feature or functionality or you know, something in jQuery that isn't supported anymore. Um, and it also just makes the older code work. It polyfills the old jQuery functionality so that if you have a plugin that the guy hasn't updated yet, you include the migrate plugin and it works again. And here's an example of the kind of output you would be getting from jQuery Migrate. Uh, not only do you get a message that you can search for, uh, you can go to the jQuery Migrate um, uh, site and, and see the exact description of what that is, you also get a stack trace. So you know exactly where it was, was called from in your own code uh, that, that caused the issue or from a plugin that you're using. Like in this case, it's errors from our, well, messages from our unit test because I was testing to make sure it actually worked. And when you go and you look that up, there's documentation that tells you, here's an example of uh, something that, you, uh, that you're doing right now that doesn't work in the new version unless you're including the Migrate plugin. And here's how to solve the problem. A lot of times it's a very small change that makes it so the code works again. And of course, everybody wants to know, well, how do you fix it? Again, the documentation says, you know, if you've got the first code snippet, which is a typical way of doing this, then use the second code snippet. It really is as, as simple as making a few changes to your code and you're done. And like I said, jQuery Migrate has the shut up and fix it mode, just include the plugin. And we hope that you see jQuery Migrate as a crutch that you lean on until your leg is better, not as, you know, it would be depressing to me to see 10 years from now that, you know, that half the sites on the internet are including jQuery Migrate because you know, that, that wasn't its purpose, but uh, you, know, you can use it for as long as you need to. There's no hall monitor watching to make sure you take it out at some point. So I wanted to, <coughs> yeah, excuse me. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the issues that we uh, fixed in, in jQuery 1.9 and why we took them out, why we, um, in, in particular, these two were removals from the API. In jQuery 1.3, I think that was 2008, we announced that, uh, that dollar.browser was deprecated. Um, the funny thing about deprecations is it doesn't necessarily mean it's going immediately, but people take, People don't like using deprecated functionality. It's like telling somebody smoking is bad, and then they like, well, I still want to do it. So the, the problem with deprecating it, with deprecating Dollar Browser in particular, was a lot of people were using it, even though it's not good practice. And so it took us from, J, from jQuery 1.3 to 1.9 before we actually got up the guts to pull it out. And here's why. Usually trying to detect the browser is not at all the best way to figure out whether you should do A or B. Um, and it's just fraught with danger. This is a good example. These are examples that I took by going to GitHub and doing a, text, uh, a code search for uses of dollar browser. Here's, here's a great one where somebody, uh, and I, I watched the diffs to, sh to see what was actually being changed. In this case, somebody was trying to look at the string uh, for MSIE and then the version for MSIE. The reason this was changed, is, does anybody know what version of IE this would break on? 10. As soon as you get a one in the first digit of the version substring there, which is IE 10, all of a sudden it looks like IE 1. And so everybody starts, uh, everybody using this code was getting a message to the effect of, you're using IE 1, you need to upgrade. The browser name is really only a brand name. It, has, it, it tells you essentially nothing about, it, especially as you do forward-looking uh, sniffs, it tells you nothing about what's going to happen in the future. And this is a perfect example. This piece of code is looking to see whether it's on Opera or IE, 
And at one point, Opera was really good about emulating all the bugs of IE back in like the IE7 days. But Opera's now announced that they would be based on WebKit, well now Blink, uh, not their own Presto engine. So this code is not only broken for Internet Explorer, but it's broken for Opera because it's looking for something I can't, you know, it's looking to fix a bug that won't be in Opera and, and is no longer in Internet Explorer either. Um, this, is, this is the classic example of why you never want to use browser sniffing because there's kind of a somewhat safe version of browser sniffing where you say, if I can detect that this is IE6, I know IE6 will never be changed or fixed. But anything, anytime you try to do a forward-looking browser sniff, it's just, you know, danger city. Um, the other problem with browser sniffing is the IE 11 betas, I mean, this is, you know, the, the game of cat and mouse. Uh, the folks at Microsoft know what you're doing, and they don't like it any more than the jQuery guys like it. So they said, well, the way most people are doing browser sniffing is to look for MSIE in the user agent string. So they took it out. <laughs> now it says IE, which most people can't you know, sniff for. They're always afraid to sniff for something that short. So because of that, in IE11, actually it's funny, if you saw the announcements about the betas that some people had been testing, the, the, the pre-beta says IE like Gecko. So it's specifically designed, there's all kinds of interesting things they're doing to try to defeat the types of browser sniffing that we also considered ba uh, bad practice that is causing a lot of code to break on Internet Explorer. So let's look at another one of the things that we pulled out, which is, uh, which is live. Um, live is kind of like global variables except for events. You, you tell uh, jQuery that I just want to handle everything once it makes its way to the very top of the document. But that's not a really good way to process events. It's kind of like making the President of the United States handle everything that happens in the entire country. Uh, it, it creates a performance bottleneck and it also makes it very difficult, uh, you know, to, on, a, on a deep uh, document, you're having to, the browser and jQuery itself has to process everything all the way up the tree to see whether any of those things match to determine whether the event should be processed at that element. Uh, we introduced in jQuery 1.7 the on method as, an, as a kind of a universal way of handling events. And if you ever decide you need to process an event globally, it's pretty easy to rewrite a, um, a jQuery uh, live event to an on event. But there's just a litany of things that are wrong with live. And again, we just looked at this API and we said, this is beyond redemption. It's bad to leave this in because it gives people the wrong impression about how events work. Um, it doesn't work well on the iPhone or, or the iPad. The way, uh, because of the way touch events interact with the document, Apple didn't want click events to bubble up to the document, so it only lets them bubble up to right below the body. Um, that, causes, um, that causes all kinds of unusual bug reports, uh, not as much as it used to be, but bug reports where somebody would say, I'm using this on an iPad with live and it doesn't, and it doesn't work. Um, and again, if you process the, element, uh, the events at a lower point on the document, everything works fine. The event propagation model that the W3C set up really was meant so that you could process events lower down the tree, and that's really what on encourages you to do. And here's some easy ways to rewrite um, live into uh, on that actually are significantly more uh, efficient. If you see the original line there, that's using live. This would be, uh, the second line would be the direct replacement, where you just essentially you're saying, I'm going to rewrite as if it were live. And the optimized replacement is really the best way to do it. If you wanted to, if your dialogue is the point at which you process the event, then that click event doesn't need to really be dealt with by anything above the dialogue, which is usually what you want to do. Um, 
I mentioned, I actually showed you one of the examples there for jQuery Migrate about parse JSON. Um, one of the things about being on about half, uh, if you look at the top 10,000 websites, jQuery is on more than half of them. So when we make a change to any API for any reason, we are going to break somebody's code. And this is an example. We got a bug report, and someone reported that parse, when you parse JSON of an empty string, it returns null. But an empty string isn't valid JSON. You, if you want to return null, you should actually parse the string null. So we said, the man is right. We need to fix this bug. And we fixed it. <laughs> well, it turns out that there are, there are, is code out there where people have server apps, and I think there's a, there's a Microsoft Ajax.net plugin. There's several pieces of code that say, I don't need to return anything. You know, it, I said the data type is JSON, but I'm just going to give you an empty string. And of course, the old behavior allowed that. So we, when people ask for changes, a lot of times you have people come by and you know, file a bug and say, I think it's horrible that $.each you know, gives you the arguments in one order, and $.fn.each gives them in another order. And we do too. We think it's really bad when our APIs are not fully consistent and easy to understand. But when you have years and years and years of people's, people writing jQuery code, you can't just go, Howard Johnson is right. We've got to go change this. So even though we have certain API changes that we do decide to make because we feel like it's in the best interest of developers long term, there's other things where we feel like this is rearranging a sock drawer. It'll look a lot nicer when you're done, but it really isn't going to improve anybody's life. Uh, one of the other things that we added in, or we worked hard on with jQuery, both one, the 1X one and 2X bill, uh, branches, is to have custom builds. We've got people who say, you know, I don't really need all of jQuery, and I want to include this, and I want it to load faster, and you know, how, how can I do that? So we came up with a custom build system. You uh, can build, and you get to select when you download the uh, repository from GitHub, you can run a custom build process that will exclude pieces you don't need. If all you need is selection and traversal and manipulation, you can just get those pieces. Right now, uh, the normal build for jQuery 2.0 is about 28K when it's minified and gzipped. The smallest build you can get with all the modules excluded is half that. And there are smaller builds to come. We've got some other things that we know that we can make uh, optional. And we're also looking at finer granularity so that you might be able to exclude even more subsets of the API for those cases where you really need to make it small. Now, obviously, if you're wanting to download jQuery from a CDN, you're going to get the full-size jQuery. And I would recommend, for most people writing web pages, especially if you are going to be working with other people, people expect the full API of jQuery. They, they don't expect a subset. And so when you start using plugins, for example, the people who wrote those plugins probably didn't expect to need to, to work to a subset of jQuery. So this is really for people who are building uh, custom things from the ground up and not depending on a lot of third-party plugins. So you may have noticed recently that we released jQuery 1.10. And after the amount of work that went into jQuery 1.9, you may be thinking, what? It's kind of this feeling, right? You've got one, but now they're giving you another one. Now what do I do? I just, I feel sorry for this dog. He's probably like, wait a minute. Which ball do I want now? Um, fortunately for all of us, jQuery 1.10 was really minor changes from 1.9. Uh, we, we primarily did it because we wanted, um, we had a, about a four-month gap between 1.9 releasing and 2.0 releasing. And in that time, there were some things that, as we got feedback, people said, well, we want the behavior to be, you know, there's some differences in behavior here that we want to, uh, to make sure the same. 
And we said, well, let's, let's make this um, as much as we can, uh, these two exactly as we said we would, exactly in sync. And so you can kind of look at the last digit and say, OK, jQuery 110 is equivalent or is feature the same as 2.0. 111, 2.1. Uh, 112, 2.2. Now you guys may be saying, wait a minute, 112, 2.2, what, where are these versions coming from? We don't have any release dates for any of that stuff. That's, that's not coming anytime really soon. So, so don't, don't start acting like there's a third ball being pushed in front of you there. But we're, we're essentially just trying to make it so that you know the 110 line and the 2.0 lines are in sync. Now, as we get patches, there may be patches specific to one line or the other and the numbers may not be exactly the same, but we don't add features on patch versions, so it's really just a question, you know, we'll try to make sure that all, as many bugs as possible are being fixed in each, um, in each major release. Now, there's been some discussion, uh, again, about which version you might want to use. Uh, the team supports both. It's not like you, I know in a lot of people's heads it's like, 2.x is out there, I should be using it. You know, 1.x, that's old news. And I don't want you to feel like you have to move yet if you don't have a situation where you can move, if you've got IE8 out there. Um, it, it's not a problem to stay with 1.x, especially for websites. I don't want to encourage people to try to, to abandon part of their audience that has IE8 because there's a lot of IE8 users out there right now. In particular, jQuery 2.0 is our go-to version for things like Chrome or Firefox plugins. If you're trying to use jQuery in Node.js, if you're writing a Windows Store app or a PhoneGap uh, Cordova app or something, you know, essentially where you're doing an embedded browser uh, or rendering, HTML rendering inside a, a native app, that would be a, a, a case where you don't need IE6 support for a situation like that. Go with jQuery 2.0. There are some situations where we had to make a choice, like it's very difficult to support IE6 and Node.js in the same version, so, or Windows 8 uh, Store in the same version. And by saying, look, jQuery 2.0 is our Windows 8 Store version, we want people to report bugs they encounter in that environment only against jQuery 2.0. So there's a few things, uh, it's funny, we had our uh, jQuery team meeting yesterday and we sat down and thought about, well, what is it that we want to do or break or fix for the next version? And we had a couple of things that we, that we put on the table to investigate and wanted to give you an idea of where things might be going. Uh, right now, our custom build process that I mentioned uses a grunt task we're looking at allowing you to use the subsets of jQuery with AMD. We still provide a, a pre-built full version of jQuery with the AMD wrappers stripped off. So as far as someone just wanting to include it off the Google or jQuery CDNs, you really wouldn't see a difference. But if you're trying to use the subsets, you'd be able to use the ability that AMD has to pull in modules as you need them. Uh, the other thing is, especially in the jQuery 2.0 area, better support for security frameworks. Um, Google is pushing hard on content security policy. In Windows 8 apps, there is also a similar type of thing to, to prevent things like uh, cross-frame access, uh, cross-site scripting exploits. And we want to help, we want to find ways to help you avoid those pitfalls because that kind of stuff is just becoming more and more common where people uh, are exploiting cross-site scripting issues. So here's, here's a little topic that I love to cover. When will jQuery 1x die? And everybody, we all, you know, if you've been in the business for a while and you've been developing websites for a year, two years, three years, you're always kind of remembering how bad it was. Unfortunately, developing websites is not like childbirth because you don't forget about how bad it was. So, so we're, we don't want to go back to the IE6 days. Uh, but I think I, uh, that 1.x uh, of jQuery can die sooner than you might think. I, I just wanted to show you there are some rays of hope. 
This is pretty much, uh, this is a Chrome version map, but it's very similar for Firefox. You see every six weeks or so, Chrome issues a new release, and boom, everybody upgrades because they don't tell anybody they're being upgraded, basically. They just upgrade them. And we like, we like that. So this has actually made jQuery's uh, work a little easier because it's nice that, you know, if a bug, if a big bug comes up, usually it can be fixed within six to 12 weeks, and we don't have to try to put in some massive work around. There, there are exceptions, there's some things in, Safari, for example, that it has been there forever, and despite the pain it causes, it's still there. But this is pretty much the way Chrome and Firefox works today. This is the way it looks for Internet Explorer. <laughs> but I want to show you the ray of hope. <laughs> if you look there, you will see that IE10 is it, it, about what, probably about March time frame, uh, the folks at Microsoft turned on auto update, which is in the same uh, frame, the same philosophy as the updaters on Chrome and Firefox, where IE9 users are just being updated. And I have some hope that at least in another year or so, that we're going to see IE9 almost gone, and that we'll see IE10 and IE11 there performing a similar little cliff every few, uh, at least every few months, maybe not quite as quickly paced as Chrome and Firefox. But the ones there that I've marked as XP, uh, they have another reason they're going to die. Windows XP is going to be gone as of April of next year. There's no support from Microsoft. Yeah. And, and if, as I understand it, I, I, I think that there will be some people who are allowed to continue to use XP. They have to pay Microsoft for support and they have to have signed a document explaining how they're going to get off of XP. So I'm really hoping that this half here, the, the, especially the, uh, the IE8 part, is going to go. Now, those IE6 guys, they're probably all the you know, illegal copies in China. And, but those people aren't buying products or visiting your website much. So I think the only other thing that that could be are web developers testing to see if their stuff works on IE6. <laughs> so uh, probably half of that's jQuery's own unit tests, I would guess. But these, uh, these are from uh, net market share, by the way, um, the statistics I'm showing here. Uh, I mean, you can always... Browser market share is very difficult sometimes to, you know, to pin down, but I, I think these are relatively realistic. And I, I want to bring up one of the problematic areas as far as future, jQuery 2.0, and that's the old Android browsers. Uh, uh, J, uh, Android 4.0, ice cream sandwich, was the first, uh, was the, a version that finally had a decent built-in browser, and of course now uh, Chrome is being shipped on, on that platform. But there's still a lot of that red sad face there, gingerbread. There are still phones shipping with Android 2.3. So the problem is those things are just a nightmare. Uh, I, you know, we hate them. They're not ECMAScript 5 compatible. The jQuery mobile guys, I think they, in one of the blog posts I said, you, you know, if you want to really help us out, you know, find somebody with an Android 2.3 phone and smash it with a hammer because we just need to get rid of it. So what we really need to do is we need Ice Cream Sandwich to become the baseline Android browser. And I'm really hoping that that will happen soon, but you can see, you know, even if they stop shipping them today, there's a long time before those make their way through the life cycle and people throw their phones away, two, three years maybe. So we can only hope. Um, that pretty much completes my presentation. We have about 10 minutes for, um, uh, for questions, and I'd love to hear your questions, and thank you very much. Do we have some mics?
If you, if you are close enough that I can see you and you stand up, I'll repeat your question and we'll, come on. Somebody Damn. knows. Any hands? We need an icebreaker here. You know how it is. Everybody's probably sitting and thinking, when are they gonna fix this bug? There we go. Hey, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the dot on, but what about dot delegate? Dot delegate has not been deprecated. I know some people like the order of the arguments for that. Uh, it's being used in several big frameworks. I think Backbone uses it. Um, so, so on could replace it, but it's not hurting anybody. <laughs> Unlike live, live was hurting people. So, so delegate is still in the API and, and we don't have any plans to remove it. Why did you remove? Why did you remove my favorite feature? <laughs> There'll be no harassing of the audience. That's my job. Um, do you gather information from any of the CDNs about um, how many people are using the older versions of jQuery versus the newer versions? I have seen that data. I believe, uh, uh, was it used? At, uh, I can't remember which, which site it is that, that provides that data. There's quite a, a few sites that use old versions. Last I looked, for example, um, Amazon.com on their homepage was using jQuery 1.2.6, and Dell was using jQuery 1.2.3. Now, the version that Amazon is using is some kind of Thunderbolt grease slapper, you know, patched version that they've hacked up. But, um, and, and I understand when you're running a big site across thousands of pages, you're always afraid to make a change. But eventually those people will want to move up. They just need an incentive, like the fact that dollar dot browser completely breaks when Internet Explorer 11 comes out. Let's hope it happens soon. There's a question back here. Keep him running, okay? I want somebody on this side to raise their hand and then somebody over here. Hi. Um, I'm probably uninformed on this, but I, I have some confusion over uh, jQuery UI and jQuery mobile. Uh, I just want to write stuff that will work uh, on the desktop, and when they access it with mobile, it's going to work there as well. So I'm kind of confused. Maybe someone can fill me in on that. Uh, that will actually, you know, that's going to be a really good question to ask Scott Gonzalez tomorrow. And he, he is going to uh, be the, the person to ask. And I agree with you. We all agree with you that that's really where the world is headed, that it shouldn't be like two different places. It should be together. So you'll, you'll be seeing some, uh, some concrete action on that uh, as time goes by here. Um, but. Yeah, it, it really should just, mobile isn't a separate thing. Mobile is really part of the web. Sure it is. My plan is working. Back corner, all right. I was curious, um, what, how do you see jQuery 2.0 in relation to Zepto and its goals? Um. You know, I don't know what's going on with Zepto. Um, I know it was created originally with the idea that jQuery was too big. And if you actually go and see the pull requests and bug reports they get, almost every one of them increases the size of Zepto. And I have total sympathy for what's going on there. Everybody is like, it's too big. You know, jQuery's too big, I'm gonna go to Zepto. Oh, this doesn't work the way jQuery did. Well, that's because there's code that we have that makes it work the way you like. So um, I, I think it's going to be difficult for Zepto to kind of carve out a space, um, especially with our custom builds and AMD builds. If you don't need all the functionality, you won't have it. Uh, and so, you know, a single monolithic but somewhat smaller version that doesn't quite work the way jQuery does is not going to be as attractive. I have a basic question about the conference. Uh, why did you choose Portland? Was it for the patchouli or the coffee? And if you could share some statistics about how, how far away people came. I don't have any statistics right now, but that's a great question. 
Uh, one of the things that we kind of philosophically we decided, we had been kind of bouncing back and forth between Boston and, and um, San Francisco for several years and decided it was kind of time to take the show on the road to places where we knew there were strong pockets of technology uh, developers that, you know, that we wouldn't make them travel so much. And also, I, I love Portland. I haven't been here for about 25 years, so um, it's changed a lot since I was here last time. But I, it's just nice to go to new cities. I mean, we all know what San Francisco looks like, and we know how much it costs for everything. So it's good to come to a place where, you know, yeah, no taxes, that's right. We came because there were no taxes and we're all tea partiers here. Yeah. <laughs> Good beer, too. Good, oh yeah, I, I must say, I'm, I'm a beer aficionado. That means I drink a lot of beer. Awesome. He just said he was from Jacksonville. I was born in Jacksonville. Uh-oh, you know my security question now. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, in the future, if you guys have a chance to come to Jacksonville, that would be great. My question is more about fluidity. Is there a, a movement or any uh, plans in the future to address fluidity in jQuery UI? And if you've already done that, forgive me that I don't know that. Uh, you mean, are you having issues where it just looks kind of jerky when things make transitions and such, I mean, or? I don't, know that, I don't know that there is a, not, a grid offering in jQuery UI, and that's specifically what I'm going after, because I use Bootstrap to kind of accomplish okay. that. Yeah, actually, we had some discussions there. I don't think we're ready to, uh, to go, uh, to be very oh, no, specific not... about what we're planning to do, but, um, but we are looking at ways, in particular, to integrate uh, a better and and unified mobile and UI CSS framework. I, I think that, again, that might be a good question for Scott Gonzalez tomorrow morning. I'm gonna leave all the hard questions to Scott. I think we are out of time on questions. We got one more? Uh, uh, hello. So you said uh, you are removing uh, ah. dollar dot browser, browser sniffing, basically. Uh, our client base is majorly on IE6. They are still using IE6 and- uh, Get out. I, I need to tell my clients to get out. So basically, we need to do a browser sniffing. So there will be any workaround for that in the future. Um, because we need to show them a dim down version in IE6 because IE6 does not support it, like everything. Yeah, it, it's just really hard to move ahead um, you know, using browser sniffing. I think it's just going to get progressively more difficult to do that. So, But I, my, my sympathies for you. My, um, let's give it up for Dave, woo!